Will the winter be a solution to minimize food waste, a way to increase employee ownership, or another innovative student-led social impact venture competing for more than $150,000 in startup capital? Join Chicago Booths with Standy Center for Social Sector Innovation and New Chicago's Polsky Center on May 23rd for the 13th annual John Edwardson 72 Social New Venture Challenge, the social impact track of the university's nationally ranked business launch program. The SNVC has jump-started more than 150 game-changing, mission-driven ventures that have raised more than $165 million. Register to watch the finals on May 23rd at bit.ly bit slash SNVC2023. Hello, listeners. This is just a note to say that today's episode explores adult themes, including sexuality and gender. If you share our podcast with your kids, you may want to give this one a listen on your own first. Thanks for listening, and please enjoy this fascinating episode. When historians of the future study our modern white supremacy movement, one of the most prominent figures they'll uncover is Jason Kessler. You may not know who Kessler is, but you're probably familiar with the infamous Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, Virginia in 2017. He was one of the organizers. A horrific scene in Charlottesville, Virginia, a white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence and chaos. A month after that insidious day, Kessler started a project he called the New Byzantium. It was an attempt to tie distant history to the present, built on the premise that after Rome fell, the Byzantine Empire was there to preserve a white heteronormative civilization. One of some of my work that has traced sort of the popular iterations of Byzantium, especially in far-right groups, they don't really know what to deal, how to deal with it and how to, what to do with it. That's Professor Roland Betancourt, a scholar at UC Irvine who studies the history of the Byzantine era. He's also a recent recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship. The Middle Ages has really become a real sticking point for a lot of far-right, white supremacist, a lot of homophobic discourse and transphobic discourse in the present. These Nazi groups are turning out in Ohio um, and the, the purported motive behind the attempted arson at the Ohio church, it's all for the same reason, to harass and intimidate trans people and queer people. In the last few years, Betancourt has written op-eds in Time Magazine and the Washington Post explaining not only this far-right obsession with Byzantium, but also why they couldn't be more wrong about what this era was actually like. Betancourt has uncovered a fascinating lost history of queer, non-binary, and trans lives that until now had gone untold. I often was sort of implicitly taught that there wouldn't be evidence for a lot of these lives. And so this project really emerged, I always say in the margins, because it was about me doing my other research and always being shocked at the things that I found in the sort of margins, in passing, that just had never been really sort of given the spotlight that they deserved. In 2020, Betancourt published a synthesis of his research on this era called Byzantine Intersectionality, Sexuality, Gender, and Race in the Middle Ages. At its core, his project is really about showing how our current debates about sex and gender aren't as modern as we think they are. They didn't just start this decade or last decade, but centuries ago. I always say people might assume that I wrote this book to the, make the Middle Ages modern, and one of the things that I was always shocked about in the process was how medieval the modern world is. I, I love that quote. And yeah. I don't, I, I don't mean that in a, I don't mean that in a negative way necessarily. All the time, there are sort of fluidities and openness in how we think that were inherent in the Middle Ages, and there are resistances in how we think that were also there in the past. We live in a time when debates about the rights of non-binary, queer, and trans people have made their way to the headlines, and even our legislatures. Across the country, at least 150 bills have been filed by Republican legislators targeting transgender Americans this year. Roughly 100 specifically restrict doctors and other providers from offering transition-related health care for minors, even when their parents approve. And Betancourt thinks the histories of how people in the Byzantine era thought about sex and gender have something to teach us today. In these moments, people care about history more than they have 
you know, in a long time. And so the role of historians, both amateur and professional historians, is very important. I think there's a lot of really trying to sort of excavate past that we've overlooked and that people have not really addressed in ways that I feel serve our present. Welcome to Big Brains, where we translate the biggest ideas and complex discoveries into digestible brain food. Big Brains, Little Bites, from the University of Chicago Podcast Network. I'm your host, Paul Rand. On today's episode, our modern connection to the Byzantine era. For those that are are, are really non-historical listeners, give me the context of when you think about the Byzantine era and why it is interesting generally to folks and how to think about it and really what was going on during that period of time in the world. Set the stage for us. Byzantium is really something that has been largely left out of Western history and how we are taught it. I always love asking friends of mine who are high school teachers, you know, how do you teach Byzantine history at all? Um, and the answers are always sad and terrifying. Um, <laughs> and I, I usually begin by saying that if you know anything about Byzantium, you probably have heard of Emperor Justinian and his wife Theodora, made most famous by their great mosaic portraits found in Ravenna in Italy. Beyond that, you probably don't know much about Byzantium. Byzantium's capital was Constantinople, which is modern-day Istanbul. And the Byzantine Empire, sort of at its height under Justinian territorially, basically covered the expanse of most of the Mediterranean. The empire goes roughly from 330, um, with the foundation of the city of Constantinople, to its fall to the Ottoman Turks in 1453. Byzantium spoke Greek and Latin, especially in its early days, And so they had access to the Bible in its source language of Greek. If you've ever read Plato or Aristotle, you've probably read it because Byzantine scribes preserved it in Greek. And that is really sort of a lot of the transmissions of the ancient world. And so because of that, Byzantium is a really interesting space. It not only has what you might think of as the heritage of pagan learning, of antiquity, but it also had the heritage of Christian learning and a lot of theological texts that were not accessible to Western medieval audiences simply because they hadn't been translated into Latin yet. Um, and so it's a very unique space that really had a very strong sort of intellectual history that, you know, much of the West is still indebted to. Well, there's a... a- many different doors you could have gone in to study this period of time, but you have chosen to focus on sex and gender in this culture. And and I wonder if you can tell us why. Yeah, so I was really struck by these very interesting and subversive narratives that colleagues had either overlooked or sought to sort of normalize. I'm also a Latinx, first-generation American, and also a queer person. So for me, a lot of that, parts of my identity have also helped me to sort of be more sensitive to some of these stories. But I would definitely say that one of the things that I was most struck by in my research was just how much the sources themselves can speak in eloquent ways that you might not even expect them with our own sort of modern eyes. And so I was really interested in how sort of a modern critical language could be deployed to bring out these stories and tell a narrative of Byzantium that could open it up to newer audiences that could be really excited by the type of sort of formulations that this past offered. And and looking at this era on sex and gender, if we could talk a little bit, move into this whole idea about queer identities during this period. One thing that's really critical about the Byzantine world is that there was an extreme number of eunuchs. Eunuchs held very high-ranking positions in the empire. Can you explain eunuchs for us, please? Sure. Um, So eunuchs were essentially young men, probably before puberty, who had their testicles removed. They were not sort of this idea of the eunuch as a slave that I think we have as a popular imaginary. They were really high-ranking figures, and literally the, the figure who sleeps beside the emperor, sort of the imperial guard, were positions reserved for eunuchs. And we have very high-ranking eunuchs who are the treasures of the empire, commissioned buildings, manuscripts, various works of art. They were even described sort of as angels. So oftentimes the depictions that we have of angels as being very pale, with sort of white flesh and white hair, is often modeled on how eunuchs appeared in the period. And so because of this, you had a real sort of confrontation with the body and its secondary sex characteristics in ways that really allowed a lot of spaces for figures 
who we might call gender variant in various capacities to exist in this world. One of my colleagues, Leah Devon, has a great book called The Shape of Sex that traces conversations about non-binary identity throughout the Middle Ages and sees how in the 13th century, the influx of ancient texts like Aristotle into the West really developed this obsession with the idea that the reasonable sort of human had to be sort of exists in a gendered binary, and that before that, especially with a lot of early Byzantine sources, there is this great deal of embrace of the idea that Adam was sort of possessing both sex, because of course Eve is produced from Adam. And so you see what I think is really interesting here is that Byzantium, because it has this corpus of knowledge accessible from early on, and also has figures like eunuchs that upset these binaries, they were thinking about these questions about gender and sexuality in really dynamic ways throughout its history, with its own sort of, you know, moments of reticence and sort of attack as well. There is evidence for all kinds of people across the LGBTQ plus spectrum in Betancourt's research, but we'll start with same-sex attraction. There's a lot of interesting evidence in the medieval world that demonstrates just how common same gender intimacies were and these various forms of queer relation were that we often tend to assume would not have existed. And if they did exist, they came about with a lot of sort of heavy handed panic. John Boswell, who was a historian at Yale, um, very famously made the argument that Byzantium had a sort of modern equivalent to same sex unions because there was this right known as the brother-making right, where two men could be sort of joined in a sort of spiritual brotherhood. They could share the same bed, live together. This has been oftentimes described as sort of queer space for queer lives to exist. Although many historians have argued this doesn't prove that people joined in this union actually had intimate relations, Betancourt discovered a document in the Vatican archive that shows otherwise. You even have church fathers in later centuries sort of attacking this right specifically because, you know, it leads to some unsavory practices. He's also found art and writings that speak speak to same-sex coupling in monasteries. You know, we see a lot of interesting evidence within monastic communities, religious same-sex communities, where you have this articulation that, you know, two monks might fall in love with each other and they might begin to have sex. Our impression of these early cloistered communities is one in which we might imagine that these relationships would be met with disgust or panic and the harshest of punishments imaginable. But So in all sort of the guidebooks and texts that describe how to sort of handle and administer these types of communities, there's very clear nonchalant sort of discussions of like, oh, okay, sort of you want to break up the relationship, maybe keep them apart. The concerns in monastic communities is like, if you have two people that are sort of in love with each other, it's sort of messy and it sort of disrupts the unity of the community as a whole. And that's really why you sort of want to dissolve those those intimacies. And so I think it's a really powerful way of sort of pushing against a lot of our stereotypes of what, you know, Christianity looked like in its early days. You do see that there is a lot of space for sort of gender nonconforming figures and queer figures to exist in these spaces. Gender nonconforming is a very modern term, like non-binary. And although it may seem as though it's also a modern phenomena, Betancourt isn't so sure. Just because they didn't have that terminology didn't mean non-binary people didn't exist. Now, there's another story about Michael Sellis, is that right? And really, you tied in stories really about a whole non-binary identity with with him. Can can you talk about that? Yeah, so Michael Sellis is, you know, one of my favorite figures in the Byzantine Empire. He is the court philosopher in the 11th century. And in many of Silas's letters, Michael explicitly talks about how, you know, he's a court philosopher and therefore, you know, he has this manly job and a manly task, but that he enjoys gossiping with the women. He cried when his daughter was born and that he feels himself to be in many ways of a feminine spirit. And so in the book, I really try to emphasize the possibility of understanding figures like Michael Psellos, who talk very fluidly and explicitly about gender identity identity in these ways to really think about how we can think more broadly and not assume that everyone is necessarily a sort of cisgender figure in history. And so Michael Silos is a really fascinating example and not a unique one, but a lot because of his erudition, 
He talks very powerfully, even at the birth of the emperor's son, saying, it's great that he's a boy, but who cares if he's been stamped more in this way or the other? So these really powerful metaphors that are really sort of captivating for, I think, especially modern readers who would just assume this language did not exist. You, you talked about monks a little bit earlier, and I, and I think it also played off in terms of a lot of the world of, the, of trans identities during this period, too. And I wonder if you can explore that for us. Yeah, so we have a great deal of stories that recount often the lives of figures who were assigned female at birth and basically live out their entire lives as men in all male monastic communities. Very critically, always being understood as eunuchs because they were beardless. Um, one monk in particular, Marinos, gets accused that he has impregnated an innkeeper's daughter who actually had sex with a Roman soldier. And he actually says, yes, I have sinned as a man and is even sort of handed over the child, kicked out of the monastery, and the text tells us about how he nursed him as his father by going to nearby shepherds to get milk. And so you have these narratives where they're constantly being tested on their gender identity or a commitment to it. And so one of the most interesting things about these stories of these trans monks is that we see a very careful discussion about how their bodies actually transform in the process of their worship and piety, what we call asceticism. So we have mentioned that they're, they stop menstruating. That is one of the very common notions often attributed to their fasting. And in many of these accounts, when they discover the body after death, they describe that, you know, they say things like, he had the breasts of women which were withered and looked like two dried leaves. Um, and you also have these discussions of the coarsening of skin through these practices, all sort of stereotypes that are associated in medical guidebooks as sort of a transformation of the body into a sort of masculine form. And even many of these stories say that as the monk is dying, he explicitly asks, please don't prepare my body for burial so that the other monks don't know about me. So there are these really poignant also desires for privacy and respect that are, I think are really sort of um, powerful to see from a medieval world. And and there's another story that came, that you brought up in this book, and I'm going to mispronounce this a little bit wrong, but Emperor Elagabalus, t- t- pronounce it for me? Yeah, I think people pronounce it variously. Um, Elagabalus. Elagabalus. Yeah, uh, people say it um, quite differently, and especially between British and American pronunciations. Um, yeah, this is a late Roman, Roman emperor, who we have preserved in Dio Cassius's history, a really negative view of the emperor, but a really negative view that is really structured completely on ideas about the sort of indication that this emperor basically identified as a woman and even went as far as to ask Roman surgeons that if they could sort of produce a vagina in their body so that they could have both organs. There are some people who want to claim that concepts like non-binary and trans are modern-day inventions, but Betancourt believes his work proves that people have always existed with these identities. You know, I also, it's important to also say, like, these moments are also not queer utopians. They aren't perfect and ideal for queer figures, but they do at times speak so powerfully. The sources themselves speak so powerfully Um, to queer and trans lives that I think it's really important to just dare to imagine like different paths than the ones that we've assumed existed. And I think this book is really about showing, you know, especially queer and trans communities like, hey, you have a long history that you're a part of. But what lessons does that history hold for us today? Well, that's after the break. Have you ever wanted to learn more about the life story of our guests or wondered what other world-changing research was happening this week? Well, now we've got you covered. Subscribe to the new Big Brains Insider from the University of Chicago. The Insider is a bi-weekly email newsletter with exclusive content featuring expanded guest interviews, groundbreaking research we are following, and other fun behind-the-scenes content. If you love Big Brains, you'll love The Insider. Visit our website to opt in now at bigbrainspodcast.com. If you're getting a lot out of the important research that's shared on Big Brains, there's another University of Chicago Podcast Network show that you should check out. It's called Capital Isn't. Capital Isn't uses the latest economic thinking to zero in on the ways that capitalism is, and more often isn't, 
working today, from the debate over how to distribute a vaccine to the morality of a wealth tax, capitalism clearly explains how capitalism can go wrong and what we can do about it. Listen to Capitalism, part of the University of Chicago Podcast Network. So let, let's let's apply a little bit some some of the historical perspective to where we are today and the the questions around trans rights and freedoms and and ability to live life is really becoming a very hotly contested um legislative issues in some cases and and how did we go from where we were to where we are today? And and why is this coming around in the way it is as you look at this as a historian? I think one of the most interesting things is to think about the ways in which a lot of the concerns that we have today and sort of rampant transphobia in particular that we see did not exist in the Middle Ages. It was not sort of the primary concern. They were Medieval theologians were a lot more concerned if there was leavening in the Eucharistic bread than they were about someone's gender identity. And I think that's really critical. And and so when we see any sort of fundamentalist notion of, you know, what the Bible says or Christianity, I'm like, well, then let's start worrying about some of the theological nuances that they actually cared about. Um, and I think that's something that's important, that, that the sort of focus on these particular issues are very unique in the present in their sort of the sort of extreme sort of articulation and concern. But yet that doesn't mean that in the past these figures did not exist or these conversations didn't exist. They were there very much so. They were just not sort of the central focus of broader sort of political concerns. One prominent example of debates about sex and gender gets wrapped up into politics is in a Byzantine text called Aptly, The Secret History. So the secret histories are really um, fascinating text. You know, historians really don't know often what to do with this text. It was produced by the court historian Procopius, who was the historian of Justinian and Theodora, who I mentioned earlier. It is a text that tells us a lot of interesting stuff about issues that were going on in the period. A lot of sort of critiques of Justinian's rule, sort of policies of taxation, sort of how he handled his administration, how he sort of enforced laws not with an even hand. And it really begins with this very almost modern prologue that's like, I was there when this was all going down and I couldn't tell you before, but now I'm going to tell you what actually happened in the court. It really sounds like a lot of the, the text coming out of the Trump administration, like I was in the room where it happened and this is what it's go- was actually happening. Just like these conspiracy theories where it's like, everything you know is wrong, I'm going to tell you what's right. And as part of the secret history's attack, he really goes off in general on the women of Constantinople for being very promiscuous, but also particularly on the Empress Theodora and goes through a lot of sort of extreme language to try to explain to the reader just how sexually depraved she was. Um, And so I think that as a political text, rhetorically, it has a lot to show us. And the attack on women is very sort of important there. You tied this to some modern parallels. Things that we're experiencing now, uh, as always, there's some historical basis with history repeating itself in different ways. Yeah, and so I thought that it was a very useful way of approaching a pre-modern text with a lens that allows us to sort of liberate that figure a little bit from the attack while also understanding like what is the political efficacy of a text like this and these types of attacks, which we still see to this day. We have a text that is really attacking sexual practices. It uses that as a way to put down someone's character, but it also develops a certain level of criticality as to why and how the author is doing that, what are the motivations, how is this sort of a political gesture, particularly in this moment. And so it's a really fascinating text because it shows us a lot of the stereotypes and language that this author used to attack a very powerful woman. And a lot of it even sort of addresses issues that oftentimes she conceived, but very rarely did she actually give birth, speaking to the practices of abortion and contraceptives that existed in the period. And one of the great lessons about the secret history is that it even attacks Emperor Justinian for the fact that after he sort of gained power and became a little bit more bold, he actually passed a law against sort of homosexual acts 
and then began to prosecute people he did not like using that law and using sort of past instances or knowledge of sort of any sort of same sex, same gender activity. And so I think that that was one of the really interesting moment of understanding that a lot of these concerns are oftentimes not religious, they are not moral, they are political sort of tools of attack. Well, you brought up a moment ago this whole idea of abortion, and we think we have uh, questions and, and issues around abortion right now. We go back to this time period. These are not new controversies, are they? No, I, you know, I think in some ways the obsession with it is the newest part. It is really fascinating, you know, you, in all these early Christian texts, you know, you have these ideas of like, oh, abortion is not great. You probably shouldn't do it, but you should also have some compassion for the mother, the woman who is choosing to do this, whether it be for medical reasons or for other reasons, to one church father even going as far as saying like, the person who should be sort of held accountable is not not the, not the woman, but actually the man, and doubly so because not only have you killed the child, but you also have caused the mother, the potential mother, to become sort of a criminal as well. But what's really fascinating is that then you look at these elite sources and these sort of gynecological medical textbooks, essentially. And they have all sorts of practices, not only for contraceptives and abortions, going as far as surgical sort of late-term abortions as well. And you really begin to see that there is such a divide. It's never sort of the elite women that are being attacked. It's always sort of these mythical, low-status women that are sort of the target of sermons. And then you have in these very exclusive imperial elite manuscripts clear evidence that these same things are going on. The same things are going on, and the women, these women have privacy to do this sort of with good medical care and in the privacy that is not sort of going to be attacked next Sunday at church. Uh, first off, it's a congratulations being named a Guggenheim Fellow for, for this year. Tell me about that fellowship and what does it mean for you and, and for what your work will be in the future? It's a really exciting and surreal moment to get a, a Guggenheim. I, when I got the initial letter, I did not believe it, and I thought it was a joke. I think that's a common response to these types of awards. Um, and it's, you know, I'm I'm going to be doing a, f- a few book projects that I've been working on. The one that's closest connected to Byzantium is really looking at how modern artists and writers have actually engaged with the Byzantine past because it is, you know, it is this odd quirk in history, and so. I've been doing a lot of interesting work with people like Tennessee Williams and Gore Vidal, thinking about how they understood the Byzantine world and their own sort of unique interests. It's really a book about the 20th century and the 21st century, sort of receptions of Byzantium, which often happen in passing mentions. Your book's getting some nice attention, has gotten some nice attention, and I'm wondering if beyond writing for a very insular world that that uh, you know may be focused on the medieval period, the Byzantine period, is there a hope that there are lessons or insights for a broader audience that get taken away from your work? And if so, what 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 do you hope that those are? Yeah, no, that's a that's a great question. You know, one of the things that I really made an effort to with this book is to really you know, venture out and write op-eds that sort of summarize sort of key takeaways from chapters. You have, you've been prolific. Yeah, and I think that's important. Not, I will say this, and I want this to be on record, it's not because it sells, sells books. Like, that is not the case. That's not how it works. But really because it's a wonderful thing that, you know, someone can show their parents or show their friends or, you know, that my colleagues can use in the classroom to teach undergrads or even in a high school classroom. So I think that that's one of the things that, as a historian, I think is really important um, to have these sort of brief pieces of writing that sort of communicate the work that we oftentimes spend decades doing sort of in very isolated um, circumstances. You know, we are historians for a reason, and I think that we often forget that, you know, there's a lot of talk about anachronism and sort of corruptions of the past to presentism, but we often forget that that's really, that idea is a very modern and sort of counterintuitive construction. You know, if you look at any public library produced in the early 20th century, if you go to any research institution from the early 20th century, there is a commitment that the humanities and the arts are for the betterment of the present. And I think that that commitment is something that we really need to embrace of not only doing sort of public historical work, but also understanding that we are active participants in our present, um, not just bystanders. Mm -hmm. 
Big Brains is a production of the University of Chicago Podcast Network. If you like what you heard, please leave us a rating and a review. The show is hosted by Paul M. Rand and produced by me, Matt Hodap, and Leah Cesarine. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.